So we should be able to understand what to eat and how to support our, our nutrient needs. And, and that isn't to downplay the importance that the practitioners play because they're, they're wonderful people. But I think a lot of our problems should be self-corrected. Welcome to the Freely Rooted Podcast, where we are passionate about helping women reclaim their metabolisms, restore their youthful vitality, and rediscover God's original design for motherhood and wellness. We are your hosts, Fallon and Corey, and we're so glad you're joining us for season four. If you're new here, be sure to listen to our previous episodes where we talk through many of our favorite foundational topics. Now grab your favorite nourishing drink and join us as we continue discussing simple, attainable, and life-changing approaches to wellness. Welcome, Morley. We are so excited to have you on. Fallon and I have been looking forward to this episode for quite a while now, and maybe some of our audience actually knows you as the Magnesium Man. Um, I love that that's one of your little nicknames, and I don't know if a lot of people actually know that before you got into the world you're in now, you actually were pretty deep into more of the Western medicine world, and I would love to hear about your transition from from that to where you got here now, And because um, I feel like that just switches switches on this whole paradigm and, you know, this transition to be able to kind of see the world differently once you make, you know, just that one transition. So yeah, tell us about it. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I was born into a very sickly family. You know, um, mom was a, an alcoholic and had all sorts of heart issues. Dad was a manic depressive with uh, schizophrenic tendencies um, and just all sorts of other relatives that were sickly and spent a lot of time in hospitals. Uh, my older sister became a nurse, so I was supposed to become the doctor, right? You know, until I got to college and realized, oh my gosh, there's a lot of work involved, and um, that was not my strong suit. So um, I still went ahead with my pre med program, but uh, I, I was only rejected by 18 medical schools. Oh <laughs> my gosh, uh, 12, that's hard to believe. Yeah, twelve in one, <laughs> twelve in one day. You know, that oh was a, that was an experience. But but it was actually a blessing, and as as one of my dear friends now, Ben Edwards, who's a an internist over in Lubbock, Texas, says, he said, Morley, it's actually a blessing that you didn't get into medical school. And I said, why is that? He said, because you didn't get indoctrinated. Absolutely. And, and he's he's absolutely right. And so if you don't get into medical school, well, you go to business school, and you become a hospital executive. So you can boss the doctors around. <laughs> and I did that. That's exactly what I did. And I never, I never ran the hospitals, but I was always a senior executive thinking about, you know, how are we going to grow this pig? How are we going to make it bigger, better? And um, did that for uh, 12 years, um, then decided that wasn't challenging enough. Let me, let me become a consultant. So I'm going to become a hospital consultant for 20 years and fly around on these little silver tubes all over the country. And, you know, it's, it's a very stressful way of living. And I did that. So I spent 32 years working on the uh, kind of the allopathic hospital side. I never worked on the pharmaceutical side. Um, and for many years, I knew there was something else I wanted to do. I just, I wasn't sure what it was. And I developed, uh, so I can picture 20 years of pulling a suitcase behind your back, you yeah. know, that has a, a decided effect on your body's physiology. <laughs> and so I developed frozen shoulder. I, I couldn't pick my hand above my waist. Wow. And so I went to see a health food store that I had frequented for many, many years, lived in the Evanston area for about 20 some years, and uh, explained my, my plight. And they said, well, you need to go see Dr. Liz. And I went, eh, I don't do witchcraft. <laughs> Because you know, I knew doctor and first name meant chiropractor, and I'm like, don't, don't go there. <laughs> totally. And so I said, we must have some supplements, and supplements didn't do anything. So a couple months later, I came back, and I was in agony. I mean, I wasn't sleeping. I was really a very uncomfortable situation. So I went to the owner, and I said, look, you must have something stronger. <laughs> and she looks me in the eye, and she says, Morley, we love you. Go see Dr. Liz. <laughs> So with my tail between my legs, I went to see Dr. Liz. And in, in two, two sessions, I had complete 
you know, motility. I mean, it was it was as close to a miracle as I ever want to get to. Wow. But it was what was important about the encounter, and this this was back in two thousand nine. She made a comment about the innate healer. Well, I I worked in healthcare for thirty two years. I'd never heard that phrase before. Like, and I didn't say anything to her at the time. But I thought to myself, if well, there's an innate healer, why do we have millions of doctors around the world? It made no sense to me. So I quietly decided I was going to discover who the innate healer is. And that's basically the quest I've been on for the last now almost 15 years is who is this innate healer? Long story short, folks, it's bioavailable copper. And we'll talk more about that. But there really is uh, an incredible mechanism of recovery and energy production and immune system regulation that has been very artfully suppressed. And it's in the literature. You, you just have to really dig for mm-hmm. it. But it's been a just an amazing journey of discovery to see how all of these uh, different pieces of the puzzle fit together. And when you know what hit a couple of years ago, I thought, well, that's the end of this whole concept. When in fact, it's become the springboard for a greater demand, greater awareness, greater desire. And it's it's absolutely been a fascinating exploration and journey. I, I would never have, have imagined, you know, in a couple of months, I'm going to be 70 years old. Wow. And I, I have more energy now than I did when I was in my 50s. And I'm excited to get up every day and say, you know, where are we, where are we headed today? I never know where the universe is going to take me. And it's just been a, an amazing process of discovery. So, so cool. That, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. I um, hopped on the call a bit later than Corey, you and, and Morley did. So I didn't get a chance to, you know, fully fawn over this call and appreciate you being here. I won't yeah. make us dive into this topic, but I, I did have to throw in uh, something you probably don't remember, Morley. My um, dear friend, Meg Langston, is someone that I'm working with currently. And she was on a phone mm-hmm. call with you one night when she was uh, looking at my full Monty. And so in a roundabout oh. way, you interpreted my full Monty. And I'm so <laughs> grateful for that. Okay. <laughs> and it sounds All like right. uh, Meg, you know, had the same thought press. She's she's wonderful. But I just had to throw Amazing. that in that I'm so grateful for your insight on, on my full Monty. So maybe we can come back to that testing in a bit. Um, but I would love to keep talking about you know, the, sort of the lack that we find in mainstream medicine. And it, it, we know that, you know, you have put just such an importance on the education of minerals. And so we'd love to hear what inspired your own research in the world of minerals, um, especially honing in on magnesium, iron, and copper. And if you have a bit too, I would love to hear how you prefer to prioritize those. Because I know, personally, whenever I bring up the the subject of Copper in particular, everyone says, well, how can I supplement that? And I'm like, well, let's step back. <laughs> so I'd love to hear, yeah. you know, your presentation of, you know, how you got into this research and then, you know, how you prefer to provide your own body with those uh, nutrients. Yeah. Well, there, there really is a divine hand. There's no, there's no question. I mean, how did I happen upon Dr. Liz? You know, she's now my wife and, and it's just been Aww. an amazing, amazing journey. And she, she had a very switched on uh, clientele. And, and one of her uh, clients was a, a clinical psychologist. And as I got into the research, she said, you know, I, I can't help but think you need to share what you're learning. I said, okay, that's a great idea. I said, what, what, I said, what would you recommend? She said, well, I think you should use paradoxical intention. I went, huh? What are you talking about? <laughs> she said, reverse psychology. <laughs> and so I, I, I went, oh, that's a great idea. And so I developed, I'm just looking to see if I can find it. Um, I, my very first book is just this little tiny, it's called Let's Get Fat. It's a 10 step <laughs> plan on, on how to get fat. And then I have a, a, an article on um, Let's Break Bones. You know? and, and the signature so article great. was, yeah, it was, it was a 10 step plan on let's make a heart attack. Don't, don't wait for a heart attack. Come on, let's go on offense and let's make it happen. <laughs> and so seven, seven of the 10 steps, though, came from the American Heart Association. Wow. Wow. And I used their research against them. And and what was really funny is uh, I, I, I put together this article and let's make a heart attack and given it to a couple of people to review. And a, f- a very high profile physician said, this is really good. <laughs> I said, great. I, said, I appreciate you saying that. And then this, this other person said, you know, she read it. She was another practitioner. She said, she said, well, I can't help but think that step number eight isn't more important than you realize. Well, step number eight was 
eliminate magnesium from your diet. Mm. And uh, so I thought, yeah, maybe you're right. So I just started digging a little bit. And bingo bongo, I'm reading Carolyn Dean's The Magnesium Miracle. And it was reading like a murder mystery. Wow. Because, you know, I've spent 32 years working in hospitals. Everyone's horizontal. Everyone, well, everyone's magnesium deficient. And so when you when you learn some of the basics, then you're convinced that if all anyone needs is more magnesium and, and they'll come back, right? And that's wrong. <laughs> and so what some practitioners said, morally, if it were that simple, we would have figured it out. Mm-hmm. And I, and in my my arrogance and my, my youth, I was like, well, you don't understand it the way I do. And I was wrong and they were right. And it's more complicated, but it's not a whole lot more complicated. But it did take me a number of years to get from when people lose magnesium, it's because they're under stress. Mm -hmm. That's, that's easy. You know, that's not rocket science, but, but what you have to understand is what's the biggest source of stress on the planet. Well, it's iron stress. Huh? It's too much iron. There's too much oxygen, oxygen and iron create what's called oxidative stress. Well, that's a fancy term for rust. Mm -hmm. And so I started to realize that the, The magnesium burn rate was a function of iron and oxygen weren't being regulated, only to find out, oh my gosh, there's this thing called copper. And it goes back a long time in our uh, planet's history that basically allows us to work with iron and oxygen and keep them from causing rust. And that, that took me about six years to figure that out. I mean, this isn't just like, well, you do a Google search and it's right there. It, <laughs> it, 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 takes, it takes a lot of uh, pieces of the puzzle to begin to talk to different people, read thousands of articles, begin to muse about it. And then you become to, to realize, wow, it really is that straightforward. And so the, the real uh, exciting part was to find out that in the 1920s, 1928 to be exact, Uh, Some very important research was done at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And basically what they did was they they took rodents and they denied them copper in their diet. Seems simple enough, right? Mm -hmm. And they they didn't know what was going to happen. And what happened was iron accumulated in the little rodent livers, like, like that. Wow. And so that was 1928. And it was a very monumental discovery that should have earned a Nobel Prize. Totally. But it ne- never would. But but there is a, a brass plaque. It's about three feet by three feet outside of the biochemistry hall where this research took place. And uh, and I think it's funny. Brass, get it? <laughs> copper? <right? laughs> and, and so that that's as close as they're going to get to a Nobel Prize. And what's important is in 2021, a team of scientists decided to update this study. Kim and Gonzalez. No one's ever heard of these folks, but they're but they're absolutely brilliant. Again, working with rodents, again, denying them copper, right? But they're doing something that they couldn't do back in the 1920s. They're studying 13 genes. Mm. And they're studying genes that relate to iron, genes that relate to zinc, and genes that relate to copper. And they want to see are any of these 13 genes going to change expression as a result of copper deprivation in the diet? And boom, one gene, one gene changed. And it's called the ferritin light chain gene. Hmm. And it's the gene that loads iron in the liver. Ding, ding, ding. And so it became this sterling moment of truth that Hart, Steenbach, Waddell, and LVM back in 1928 were spot on. And here we have Kim and Gonzalez proving genetically that this is the mechanism. When you withhold copper in an animal's diet, and unfortunately we're all animals. Sorry sorry to break it to you. But when you, <laughs> but when you withhold copper from an, an animal's diet, um, iron is going to accumulate in the liver. And it's a fact. And it doesn't just stop at the liver. It's going to go into the heart. It's going to go into the neuroendocrine system. It's going to go into the brain. And this is a dirty little secret that people don't know about. And it's unfortunately not taught in doctor school. I don't care what the 
the, the modality of training is. And so, uh, Fallon, to your to your point, I mean, I've studied, you know, there, there's there's uh, eighty some minerals, you know, and you could easily get lost in all eighty of them, eighty four or whatever the exact number is. But what I came to realize is that there's only a few that really matter. And again, it's if you understand the dynamics between copper and iron, and then if those don't go well, you're going to lose magnesium. And once you start to accelerate the magnesium loss, then, you, then you've changed the oxidative stress dynamics in the body. You've changed energy dynamics. And so what I've, what I've elected to do is focus on the critical few to have this significant metabolic impact and it seems to be helping folks. That is it is it perfect? No, but it's pretty darn good, and it really gives people a uh, a workable game plan that allows them to take control of their lives. And I think that's what's been missing. Is what I really wanted to do. What I really uh, sought to do in this process was I wanted to democratize healing. I, I wanted to transcend. Why, why do we need practitioners? You know, we're smart boys and girls. We should be able to understand what to eat and how to support our, our nutrient needs. And and that isn't to downplay the importance that, that practitioners play because they're, they're wonderful people. But I think a lot of our problems should be self-corrected. And and again, if we can manage our stress, if we can manage our diet, if we can manage our, our magnesium burn rate, uh, I think we can go a long way to, to helping each other get through our, our lives. That is so good. There's so many pieces of gold that you touched on, even that, even that last little bit about if we, if our bodies are actually capable of self-healing, self-correcting with the right tools, mm -hmm. what kind of paradigm would we live in and how much less would we outsource constantly to authority figures or other people right. in order to just like go through this life and, and thrive. And one thing I've I've really picked up about you, Morley, is your ability to think critically. And my mentor, Michelle Chatham, she was the first person that kind of talked to me, talked to me about this idea of critical thinking. If someone is not able to critically think, it's their pursuit of an answer, needing an answer like right away, like one single mm -hmm. answer, and they need that answer right away. But if you're able to think critically, right. you are able to kind of ponder. Right and think and see what comes up. And that's exactly what has happened in your own trajectory. And so I would love to talk about just this idea of the iron story. You've, you've brought up iron and just how pivotal the role is of copper in our body's ability to use iron. But what is the, right. what is the story of iron on our planet right now? And how did we get to a place where we are more overloaded with iron that maybe, than maybe we used mm. to be? Yeah, no, I'm happy to speak to that. And let me just comment real quick. You know, I, I wasn't always a critical thinker. You, know, mm. you think, oh gosh, he was—he came out of the womb challenging his mom from day one. I, <laughs> that was not—that was not my nature. I mean, I was a—you know—I've been a rabble rouser. I've, I've been a—I'm uh, a second born, so I don't follow rules very well. But I wouldn't say that in my um, in my youth, especially like in, in my collegiate years. I don't know that I was a really critical thinker. That 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 evolved over time, and I think it's really uh, exploded in the last probably ten to twelve years. And and I I don't know that I know exactly what happened. I, was it Maypo? I don't I don't know what I was doing, but something changed. And I, I think I sort of know what it is. Um, when I realized the magnitude of the problem, I realized I couldn't back away from it. Right. I guess I, I let me rephrase it. I chose not to back away from it. And, you know, one of my one of my uh, clients, uh, 30 something uh, individual with uh, Lyme, couldn't work. So he taught himself astrology. And so the, the consult started. And I'm, and I'm going to get to your question about iron, Corey, don't worry. Um, but let, let my mind wander for a bit. But he, he started the, the conversation. He said, Morley, what, what's your birthday? I said, well, no one's ever asked me that, but it's middle of November. He said, I knew it. I said, what did you know? He said, I knew you were a Scorpio. I said, well, how, how did you know I was a Scorpio? He said, he said, only a Scorpio would dig, dig, dig the way you have. He said, but only a true Scorpio would take on the entire medical establishment and not back down. 
And that's basically what I've done. And that really gets to your question, Corey, about this iron issue. What we're supposed to believe, according to the World Health Organization, most recent publication being 2012, where iron deficiency anemia is the number one nutrient deficiency on planet Earth. Right. We're supposed to believe that, right? Has the has the WHO lost a, uh, a little bit of an edge? Mm, yeah, maybe in the last couple of years. But but the thing is, uh, it's a very well recognized nutrient deficiency, iron deficiency, and the meme that runs medicine and nutrition is you're anemic and you're copper toxic, right? We know we've heard that. We've, we've it's so embedded in our psyche we don't even don't even question it. Totally, I questioned it. Because um, what's the number one element on planet Earth? It's called iron. 34% of the Earth's composition is iron. That's a lot of, that's a lot of iron, folks. Totally. <laughs> and, and prior to uh, 2020, I would have argued that humans were the most evolved species. Now, I'm not so sure. But, but for, for us to accept that iron deficiency anemia is legit, it means that the most evolved species on the planet has lost the ability to metabolize the number one element on the planet. That doesn't make any sense at all. And so I, I began to, at the, at the very macro level, began to question that. Then um, as I got into the research, I, and I can't tell you exactly, well, I, actually I do know what happened. I, I was a real student of stress because I was focusing on magnesium loss. I mean, I became obsessed with stress. And I was reading an article by an, an Italian iron researcher. And if you really want to understand iron, go to Italy. They understand it better than anybody else on the planet. But this Italian researcher said the greatest stress on planet Earth is iron stress. I went, oh, my gosh, that's, that's what's causing the magnesium burn rate. Is the iron's not being managed? Well, then I had to back in and find out who's in charge of iron. <laughs> Only to find out that it's copper. And and again, it, it gets into some very subtle uh, nuances because in the world of traditional Chinese medicine, copper is the general and iron is the foot soldier. We don't have to be in the military to know there's a difference between a general and a foot soldier, right? And so then we get into the numbers. There's 100 milligrams of copper, ideally, in the human body. 100 milligrams fits on the head of a one-inch stick pin. It's a really tiny, little tiny bit of iron, of, excuse me, copper. And what are we supposed to have? Like 5,000 milligrams of iron. So it's 50-fold more iron. And it's like, oh, my gosh. This little little speck of copper is running this big, you know, uh, phalanx of, of iron. And you start to really get into the, the, the nuance of it. And you start to realize, well, wait a minute. There's another statistic that's running out there. It isn't just that iron deficiency is the number one nutrient deficiency. It turns out that for the last 80 years, it turns out that copper deficiency has been the number one nutrient deficiency on the farm. Oh, wow. So that begins to change things. So if we don't have copper in the soil, it doesn't get in the plant, doesn't get in the animal, it doesn't get in the human. And so then it begins to really change the whole dynamic. And then just to really make it more exciting, you guys want it exciting, right? Yeah. So you, you, Corey wanted to talk about iron. Well, we're going to talk about iron. Every second of every day, every second, and we've been talking now for about 40 minutes, but every second of every day, we have to replace two and a half million red blood cells every second. Hmm. It's, it's 200 billion red blood cells in 24 hours. And that's, that's 1%. So it's, it's 200 billion times 100. Is, it's a really big number. But we have to replace over the course of you know, 100 days. But there's this constant process of turning over red blood cells. Two and a half million per second. Click, 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 click. Think of, think of the sophistication of our physiology that it can keep track of that. Now, here's the part that's mind-numbing. 
two and a half million red blood cells a second, you know, 200 billion every 24 hours. And the amount of iron needed to replace 200 billion red blood cells is 25 milligrams of iron. 25. Now, there's a catch. There's a catch. <laughs> Wait, there's more. <laughs> 24 of those 25 milligrams come from our recycling system. And the formal name is called the reticuloendothelial system, RES. It took me two years to figure out what reticuloendothelial means. It means recycling. And so I'm not slow. It's just that cleverly hidden. But maybe I am that slow. Uh, but, <laughs> but the thing is, the thing is um, 24 milligrams needs to be recycled. Only one milligram a day is needed from our diet. Now, this, mm. is not, this is not me making this stuff up. This is the greatest iron biologist on the planet. Robert Crichton, Douglas Kell, Gutteridge and Hallowell, uh, Ed Weinberg. I mean, these are, the, these are the top of the pecking order of iron biologists. All agree on, we just need one milligram of iron a day. And trust me, we get way more than that on a daily basis. Totally. And I, I mean, I, I was born in 1952. I, I would be embarrassed to tell you what I ate for growing up. I mean, it's just <laughs> staggering amounts of, of cereal and sugars and things like that. And so the, the thing is, if we don't know about the recycling system, and most people do not, and most practitioners do not, then they're led to believe, oh, well, we got to keep pounding down this iron, when in fact, it's not working. And so if we're pounding down iron, that means we're suppressing copper, which means we're building iron in the liver, which means we're building iron in our tissue. And, and, and that's, the, that's the swirling insanity of iron metabolism in the human body. And no one's thinking about this. And, and the, the, one of the most important things for folks to keep track of is the, the fact that we use blood tests, right? So iron will show low in the blood work, but blood work is not tissue. We've been led to believe it's the same, but it's mm -hmm. not. And so a very important scientist mm -hmm. named Bruce Ames, world-renowned biochemist, uh, at one point during his career, he was at Berkeley for decades, but at, at the peak of his career, he was the most quoted scientist on planet Earth. Wow. So when E.F. Hutton speaks, let's listen, right? And so in 2004, Bruce Ames and David Kalilia, his principal investigator, did a study. And what they found, 2004, is that there's 10 times more iron in the tissue than there is in the blood. Wow. 10 times. Yeah, there is a wow to it. And so <clears throat> what are, are all decisions made based on anemia, based on blood tests? There's no blood test that measures tissue levels of iron. Now, I've got some colleagues in, in uh, Florida who are now using uh, Tesla II MRIs to begin to score livers and pancreas and heart and brain, and they can begin to identify the amount of iron toxicity there is in these organs, which is a, wow. a wonderful breakthrough. But it's like, it'll be decades before that's adopted. But the, mm -hmm. but the point is, people have been trained like circus bears, to believe that they are, in fact, anemic, that they are, in fact, copper toxic, and they don't know what, what foods have copper, much less whether they should be eating them. And they do know that they're supposed to be eating more iron. And to me, there's no more vulnerable population than pregnant women and their fetuses. I, I, I don't lose sleep, but... But if I were, that would be a group that I would be worried about. But, but the misunderstandings about iron fortification, iron supplementation, is it's a crime. It's a crime against humanity. And we can go into some of the details as you wish, but the, the whole um, confusion about iron is global. And, and I think it's... Uh, I, I so appreciate having conversations like this because yet a new audience gets introduced to these pearls of, of truth that have been glossed over for almost a century now. And I think it's time 
to dust off the truth and let people know what's really going on. So totally. hopefully, Corey, that gives you more to work with from your, your question. Yeah. And I think we'll, we'll even go into detail later in the podcast as we talk more about pregnancy, but I just, I can't even tell you how many messages I received. I had posted that we were going to interview you on, on the podcast. And so many people reached out saying, oh my gosh, I've been waiting for this conversation back when I was pregnant. You know, I was diagnosed with, you know, iron deficiency, anemia, got put on, right. put on iron supplements, iron pills, and then ended up hemorrhaging or bleeding a profuse amount. And so there's clearly more to the story and I'm, I'm, I'm so excited to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the tragedy is people don't know about the research of Philip Steer. He's a, a UK uh, obstetrician and absolute genius. And he did a study in 1995 that looked at 150,000 live births. I would have been impressed if he'd done 1500. <laughs> yeah. hundred. 150,000 150, live births. Wow. And what he wanted to correlate was what is the hemoglobin level of the mom upon delivery of the child correlated with APGAR scores, healthy weight babies. And he wanted to see what's the sweet spot. It's a really basic question to ask. And, and in the world of iron biology, a, a a woman who's not pregnant, her hemoglobin should be around 12 and a half to 13 and a half. That's considered normal. When a woman gets pregnant, the first half of the pregnancy, not a lot changes. It's going to stay in the probably in the low, low 12s. But then as the pregnancy progresses, Mother Nature has a plan. I mean, she really does. I, mean, she, I think Mother Nature is pretty smart. <laughs> and it's called hemodilution is the term that was coined back in the, the 1920s. But basically what happens is the hemoglobin level drops in the mom's body. Where is it going? It's going over to the baby. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not complicated. <laughs> and so what, what, what did Dr. Steer discover? He discovered that the healthiest babies were born to moms whose hemoglobin was between 8.5 and 9.5. Now that's considered heretical in the conventional era. Because if, when it gets below 12, birthing practitioners get nervous. When it gets below 10, they become unglued. Mm -hmm. And they're very quick to advise their clients to not just take supplements. I, I've had two clients a week before they delivered get iron infusions. Both women almost died. Wow. And both babies almost died. Oh, my gosh. And this is happening all the time now. This is, this is a crisis around the globe, and not enough people know to question, wait a minute, what does Mother Nature think about this? And there's all sorts of flexing of muscles of the practitioners, and they're, they're just doing what they've been trained to do. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean they're, I think what's happened is the practitioners have confused their training with the truth, and they're not the same. And so I think uh, people need to be asking better questions and demanding better answers. And, and if the practitioner does not know about Philip Steer in 1995 research, then that would be a great starting point for dialogue to say, well, let's talk about what was learned in England uh, during that, that pivotal study. And this idea that you need more iron to prevent hemorrhaging, it's like, no, that's that. That is just. I I don't know where those where those conclusions have been drawn, but but they're not supported by the research, and it's it's an uncomfortable conversation to have with clients. Uh, it's an even more uncomfortable conversation to have with practitioners, but it but it needs to take place because we need to challenge this mindset, this mindless uh, adoption of certain standards that are not serving the, the public well. So. It really needs to be challenged. Yeah. I, I mean, I'd love to go even into more detail about that and then come back later to, to some other questions. But you sure. know, what's interesting is like this study that you reference, Steer, um, well, we'll link that in the show notes too, but it's so interesting because I've, I've sent that resource to quite a few people and the typical response, and I'm sure you hear this all the time, and this is where it comes down to like, what, what are we really doing during pregnancy with who we are outsourcing our power to, because a lot of, a lot of moms 
feel so anxious and uncomfortable about talking to their midwife about this Mm -hmm. and even just showing them the study that they're like, I'm just going to maybe just take the iron supplements. You know, it's almost Mm -hmm. more uncomfortable to challenge someone who's holistic. And a lot of our audience are home birthing and, Mm -hmm. uh, kind right. of like midwifery care kind of women. And there's also a ton of, a ton of people who listen to our podcast who are more in the obstetric, uh, I guess, I don't even know the word, what the word you guys go to get what I'm saying, but you would think like, okay, maybe it would be better talking to a midwife than maybe your OB about, you know, this information and people would feel a little less threatened, but you, mm-hmm. but morally, you know, more than anybody, probably how there's still kind of a flex of authority And, um, yeah, there's an, there's an interesting response that I've seen midwives take when they're, when they're challenged on this, they're Mm -hmm. like, Oh, you know, don't you dare challenge my, they get very defensive. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to watch the emotional reaction and, and just even that power play between mom and midwife when you, when you would think that would be such a more supportive environment. Yeah. Well, let's, let's take it down a notch, but (laughs) let's, let's go into the mother's womb. Let's let's talk about the forgotten organ, the placenta. Totally. And a, a really important researcher for your followers to know about is a guy named Harry McArdle, M C A R D L E, absolute genius. He's based in Scotland, Aberdeen, Scotland. Doesn't get more Scottish than Aberdeen. <laughs> and the guy, the guy is brilliant, but he's the guy. Harry McArdle, he's the guy that discovered a very important protein that nobody talks about. And so people who may have, may have heard me talk before, have certainly heard me talk about ceruloplasmin, you know, it's, it's, it's a very important protein. It's, it's, a, it's a beast of a, of a protein. It plays many different functions in our body. Well, it turns out that um, there's three proteins that are found in the placenta of the mother's womb. And and one of them is ceruloplasmin. Another one is called Hephaestin, like like Hephaestus from the the, uh, iron lore, Hephaestin. And there's a third one called Zyklopin. Z-Y-K-L-O-P-I-N. These three proteins all express the ability to move copper and iron between the mom and the fetus. There's nothing more important than that because we live on a planet with oxygen in the air. And 21% of the air we breathe is oxygen. Guess what? It's a poison. Oxygen is not our friend. And, and what's really important for, for the moms to be to understand is that there's nothing more vulnerable than the developing fetus. And, and my two favorite quotations around pregnancy, one is by Mildred Seeley, who was a world-renowned physician who's, who was an expert in magnesium. And her famous signature statement was, Pregnancy is a magnesium deficient state from stem to stern. The other quotation that I absolutely love is by a famous alpine physiologist. His name was Sir Joseph Barcroft, who cut his teeth in the 30s studying mountain climbers. And then in his 60s and 70s, he decided to turn his attention to pregnancy. And his famous saying is, pregnancy is Mount Everest in utero. It's a great statement. It's like, what is he talking about? Well, it turns out that the amount of oxygen in the womb in the first trimester is between 1% and 3%. It's an anaerobic environment. turns out that the fetus is a parasite. It's an anaerobic parasite feeding on an aerobic mom. And that's that's the truth. Well, here's the catch. How do you make energy anaerobically? We gotta have 10 enzymes. 
and of those 10 enzymes, eight of them require magnesium. That's what Dr. Selig was talking about. The reason why pregnancy is a magnesium deficient state is because you're making energy anaerobically because it's in this low oxygen environment. And it's like, oh my gosh, this is getting fascinating now. And is any of this taught in practitioner school? No, no. You would think that they would be giving you know, the, the doctors and the, and the midwives these um, spikes and cleats and things to, to know how to you know, help the mom through this uh, pregnancy, but they don't do that. And so there's total confusion about this. And so the, why, is, why is iron and copper so important on a planet with oxygen? Well, iron is a waiter. It, carry, it carries oxygen. You know, 70% of the iron in our body is in hemoglobin carrying oxygen. Another, another 10% is in our muscles, myoglobin. So 80% of our iron, an enormous amount of our iron, is a waiter. But, but no one ever talks about the chef, do they? And, and who's the chef? Who's slicing and dicing the oxygen, turning it into water to release the energy so we can exist? It's, it's copper. Copper is the... I call it the cuisine artist, so we can you know, spell it C-U, right? I-S-I-N-E. And so the, the, the world has been trained to focus on the optics of iron, but they don't know about the chef. And they don't realize that it's copper that's enabling energy production. And in the, in the placenta, the movement of iron and copper between the mother and the baby is absolutely pivotal for the health and well-being of both. And yet no one's talking about it. And, and what's, what's, the, what's the focus? Well, what's your vitamin D status? Well, what's your iron status? It's like, well, that's okay. I, I understand you're concerned about that, but, but why, don't we, why don't we focus on the energy side of, of the equation? And there's just is not enough attention being given to the energetics of producing babies and the energetics of recovery for the mom and the, you know, the postpartum depression. They might wonder where that's coming from. It's not coming from Mars. It's coming from a mom who probably didn't have enough copper to begin with, donates this enormous download of, of copper in the third trimester. So the three of us have livers that have about seven milligrams of copper. When we were born to healthy moms, our livers had 70 milligrams of copper. It's an enormous difference. It's a tenfold difference. And so in the modern era, I don't think women have that. I don't think they have the mineral capacity that they're supposed to have. No offense. Again, they're the fourth or fifth generation in their family to be minerally depleted. And they, they give whatever they've got. Again, the myth, myth on the planet is babies are born perfect. No, babies take whatever they can get. And so the baby takes whatever it can get, and the mom gives up all the copper she's got, and she gets depressed because of it, because she doesn't have enough for energy production. And what is depression? It's not an emotional state. It's an energetic state. She can't make energy to respond to her environment. And so it, it just, unfortunately, it isn't rocket science. Totally. I mean, it, 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 there's some very basic principles that need to be understood. And again, this is a, the work of, of Weston A. Price is instrumental. I mean, he's, he was a man and, and his, uh, his wife, uh, she was way ahead of their time um, in terms of their research and what they were able to, to document. And I think if, if Dr. Price had lived a little bit longer, he probably would have discovered the importance of copper. I really believe that because he was all over retinol. Mm -hmm. Well, retinol and copper are, are just magical together. And so I think there needs to be more awareness about the copper retinol dynamic and, and maybe not so much concern about the iron vitamin D side. And that's a, that's a bitter pill for some people because they, they're just convinced that that's the, where the sun rises and sets. <laughs> but I think when you, when you really study healthy fetal development, when you really study healthy maternal development, you're going to see a lot of research around copper and retinol. 
it's inescapable. And, and that's not necessarily adopted in, in the modern era. Totally. And, and I, and, and I'm such an expert, you know, I've given birth to so many children, right? Yes. <laughs> in fairness, we still consider you an expert, you know, childbirth oh. ability oh. or not. Um, yeah. Well, it's, it's fascinating to me. I mean, I've had three children now, but two, well, actually three children were born when I was kind of a consumer in the functional medicine sphere. Mm -hmm. And okay. not once did someone, you know, address or bring up my copper levels or mineral status at all, despite the no. fact that I was in and out of, you know, physicians offices all the time. Um, and I love that you brought up Dr. Price because I, I was thinking of a story from nutrition and physical degeneration. He, I think it was a community in the um, Swiss Alps or somewhere in Switzerland, their mm -hmm. nutrients in their dairy uh, yes. were just astronomically higher than, uh, you know, what we would see today. And turns out the hay that the cows were feeding off of was very green and very high in chlorophyll. Um, which is, you know, a source of copper. And so that just was so fascinating to me that, you know, you mentioned Morley that, you know, you really think Dr. Price would have been, you know, a kind of a, a spearheader of, of copper prioritization had he had his mind wrapped around that. But it's almost like he he did without knowing it, <laughs> which is what's so interesting. Oh, he did. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So yeah, it, I love that absolutely. story. I always think about that. Um, and just, you know, gosh, it's just cool to see how nature plays out. And it, we do want to keep talking about the the pregnancy conversation. And I know we kind of touched on, mm -hmm. you know, these women that have, you know, quote, low iron at the end of pregnancy, and then they are either told they are too risky for a home birth, or they're encouraged by a provider mm -hmm. to, you know, take right. XYZ steps. Right. And I'd love to hear, you know, how would you encourage women that are in that scenario that, you know, really want to um, stand up for themselves and, you know, for their preferences, you know, especially when it comes to home birth and isolation, you know, how do you encourage a woman to advocate for herself, regardless of her birthing location? You know, how do pregnant women you know, just take on the confidence to sometimes help educate their caregivers right. and stand by, you know, what they foresee as a healthy, safe birth? No, it's, it's a wonderful question. And it, and it takes a certain amount of resolve to, to stand up to authority, you know, I, I, but I think what's important for people to realize is that there is compelling research to challenge the status quo. Just because the, the midwife says it or just because the obstetrician says it doesn't mean it's an absolute uh, lock. It just means that's an opinion. That's what they were taught. One, one of our friends is, um, they're, they're Amish and they were having their ninth child. And they're, they're just a lovely couple. And um, most recent baby was what you would call an RCP baby. You know, they've been following the, the, the uh, philosophy of the, of the root cause protocol. And, and what the dad was sharing with me was he said this, this uh, number nine was completely different. He said it was like he had butter all over his body. He'd never seen that before. And again, that was from the mom was really uh, taking the, the cod liver oil and being very careful about it. And, and at one point, the, the dad asked the, the midwife, well, aren't, aren't you going to, aren't you going to bathe the baby? Because it's covered with this butter, you know, and the and the midwife who apparently was pretty switched on, she said, um, "You know, you probably didn't need my help producing this baby, did you?" He said, "No." She says, "You probably don't need my help then getting him ready for his life." And he was like, "He said, you mean we're going to leave him alone?" She said, "Yeah, let's leave him alone." And he was so ecstatic because that's not. That's not the rigor in in the necessarily in the Amish community, but I but I think to your point about uh, what is it that, that women need to do, I, I think what's really missing is I don't think there's enough communication with our parents and grandparents to find out what what was the standard of care, what what did we do? Uh, I think within our certainly within the last seventy five years, uh, having a baby is becoming a it's a medical event. It's not. It's it's called natural. It's it's a very natural process. It's been taking place on the planet for a long time. Are there complications that can take place? Of course there are, but th but this idea that we need to be in a sterile setting and and um, Dr. Liz and I have, have enjoyed the Netflix series called The Midwife, and it's a, it's a fascinating and I'm sure you're familiar with it, but um, it it was it starts in the mid fifties and where we got to was like early 60s, mid-60s. Mid, mid the progression and how 
um, midwifery changed in that decade is striking where they went from just showing up in their, their uniforms and I just need a, a bucket of hot water and things like that. And now they're, they're showing up in their gowns and they're, you know, they've got all this stuff and it's a very sterile environment. Now they're in an institution. That's all, that's all within a 10 year period. And so I think we need to really question, is that necessary? And I think there really needs to be a wholesale. I, I think the, the, the birthing community, of which I'm sure you all are actively a part of, needs to begin to really challenge some of these assumptions that have been made about, well, what, you know, to your point, Fallon, what, why doesn't anyone measure my copper status? What, why doesn't, when was the last time someone measured your magnesium status when you were pregnant? It, again, if it's a magnesium deficient state from stem to stern, it would be a good thing to know what's the magnesium RBC as soon as we find out the woman's pregnant, all the way to the delivery. That'd be a good, that'd be a really good thing to know. And, and what do we do? Oh, we wait for the mom to go into preeclampsia. And then we come riding in with our white horse, hoping to, to give a, an IV and, and save the day. Seriously, do, do people really believe that that's the way to do this? And, and what is preeclampsia anyway? It's oxidative stress on steroids. Well, why is the oxidative stress building? Because Oh, maybe because oxygen is not being managed, right? Maybe because serotonin is building inside the mother's womb. Why isn't serotonin being turned off? Because there's not enough bioavailable copper. And, da, 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 da. And, and again, and these basic principles apparently are not being taught in practitioner school. And I, I think that's unfortunate. And, and we're left with these types of uh, switched on conversations. But people need to know that if they challenge the status quo, they're not going to die. It's a little uncomfortable. It is a little uncomfortable. But you stand your ground and you say, well, why don't you show me the research that, that backs up your position? I'd, I'd just like to see it. I'd like to read it. I'd like to understand it. And if the practitioner gets defensive, well, that's a real chink in the armor. Because if they, if they are really well-trained and confident, they should be happy to share their, their information. I mean, don't you think? I mean, because we're, we're, I think what, what's happened, though, is we now know, you know, two years into the, the psychodrama of the world, we know that there's more to the story. Now we know to ask more questions. And I can't think of a better question to ask than at the point of producing a baby, what, what's the right diet? What's the right nutrient focus? What are the right priorities? What what kind of testing should we really be doing? You know, maybe this copper thing is important. What I'd love to know what my ceruloplasmin is, doctor. Could you tell me? And it just, I think it would be really good for people to know that. And again, it, it's not to be a, a provocateur. I'm just I'm sharing basic research, and and when you find out that people like Harry McArdle have been talking about this for thirty years, it's like, wow, where where does that knowledge go? And and I think that the women and their and their um, partners who are having these families, I think they want to be empowered. I think they want to know what, what what's the waterfront of knowledge that I need to know. I don't need to be an obstetrician, but I need to know the basics. And you know the the article that I I sent out to uh, to Corey and, and Fallon, I'll get it out to you as well. It, it's a it's a fascinating article about oxytocin. We don't. I'm not going to talk about it, but it's like, it's like, oh my gosh, oxy, oxytocin. Oh, maybe it has something to do with this oxygen thing. It has everything to do with the oxygen thing, especially inside the womb. And it's like, I didn't know that. And it, it was just this amazing article that began to introduce the delicacy of oxygen becoming water to produce energy, to support the, the, the birthing process. And, and it's like, we, we don't need to turn everyone into um, obstetrical physiologists, but I think we need to turn the, the, the parents into mineralists who understand that there is a dynamic here, that there is an, an energy process that needs to be supported, that there, there may be more to the story than just vitamin D and iron, and, and to feel comfortable and confident just let's have a if we can't even have dialogue about it 
then there's something wrong. What, what, what's the what's the other side of the story? Why why can't we talk about this retinol copper thing? Why can't we talk about magnesium? And I think it's important for people to feel at ease with um, trying to better understand more of the dynamic, because it, it, at the end of the day, who doesn't want a healthy baby? Who doesn't want a healthy recovery? Who doesn't want to, you know, get back to sleep and and start producing breast milk? And and what and what is what's the bulk of the breast milk? It's retinol. That, that's really what breast milk is. Mm. And so the baby gets this enormous download of copper in the third trimester, big bolus, seventy milligrams. That's a lot of that's a lot of copper, folks. What's the other download? Retinol from mom in the in the breast milk. But I mean, it's it's. We don't talk about it in those terms, but that retinol and that copper form the backbone of the infant's uh, immune system for the first two years of life. Well, that's beautiful. Wow. And, it's, and I think there's a, a certain grace that we should all understand those dynamics so that um, it's not to minimize the involvement of the practitioners. It's to, to support them with your own understanding of what's going on and to... to um, enhance their understanding of what's, what's taking place. I, I think that's a very reasonable uh, approach to take to this miracle called life. Totally. And also just this idea of not waiting, not even living out this paradigm where you're waiting for this like test and then this like emergency of like, oh, what, what do we got to do? You know, depending on these test right. results, like these lab values, as opposed to right. What can we proactively be doing? Number one, conversations. Number two, speaking with our provider or midwife about what we're eating, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And just yep. like, I, I know my own personal experience with my midwife, we just had a conversation in the beginning of just like, hey, what is my what does my nutrition look like right now? And I told her I wasn't taking prenatals. I told her, hey, I'm really prioritizing animal-based and, you mm -hmm. know, lots, I was taking raw beef liver. I, I explained to her like, hey, this is what I'm getting. And so when the conversation came up where she was like, do you want to go get these tests done? I was like, no, there's not, I don't mm -hmm. feel a need right. to get those tests done because they don't resonate with what I know I value as far as what my pregnancy expresses. And so right. we just omitted those tests and it was never even an issue because she trusted that my body, um, is doing what it's supposed to do because she knew that I was laying the foundation and, right. Uh, that is just a really important conversation to have. And also I love that you talked about breast milk and then just this conversation of prenatal nutrition in general, how much smarter nature is in, in being able to show us, you know, right. what is the right. optimal way that we can be providing our body with the foundational pieces. So, so we can just trust our body to do the rest. And, uh, so I, I wonder what you would say as far as, you know, proactively in the beginning or, uh, even better before pregnancy, you know, preparing our body to be able to have the, those, those tools. Do you have some favorite foods? Do you have some, I mean, you're, mm. you're, you have plenty of resources on this, of course, that we're going to link in the show mm -hmm. notes as well. Sure. But, um, like is a, is a prenatal something that you recommend that women are taking and, you know, beef liver, is that pretty high on the, on the priority list? I'd love to hear you talk about food during pregnancy. Right. Yeah. No, I, again, I, I think the, uh, the tenets of the um, Weston A. Price community are, are very solid. Um, and so uh, I think that, again, in the, the research that Dr. Price did, they were able to identify the, the lengths that these communities went to to prepare their young adults for uh, having children. Again, it's nutrient-dense foods. So I think that's very, very important to the to the process. Um, the the again, the, the, there really are babies out there called RCP babies, and they, they uh, it's very comical. But but they, these women say the pregnancies are completely different. They they don't have the the kinds of challenges. Uh, they don't have the food cravings that, you know, the, the deliveries go differently. And that's, that's not to say anything about the RCP. It's mother nature is really what we're talking about. And it's just making sure that the nutrient dense foods are given a priority. And, you know, I, I can't explain, you know, P 
peanut butter and pickles and it's like that there's that's a side of of pregnancy i've never understood but but again um the, the mom does need real solid nutrition in order to provide the nutrients for the for the uh, offspring I, I think the issue about um the, the prenatals i don't think the run of the mill prenatal makes sense again the, there's the the b vitamins are too synthetic uh, there's usually too much calcium uh, there's usually way too much iron uh, relative to the to the copper that's there, uh, the, the calcium to magnesium ratio is is usually off. Uh, I think it's um, I think it's North American and spice. I think they have something that a number of people have found to be helpful. I love that um, brand. Yeah, Potent Pack, Potent Pack, P A K. Uh, that is one that a number of people that I've heard of over the, over the years have found that to be very very helpful. Um, but I, again. Um, I think people need to be really sensitive to this iron issue, um, more so than they realize. And the um, one of my friends is a, a lactation consultant, and I was surprised when she schooled me up and said that if you want to increase milk production, do a blood donation. I went, wow! And think about it. Th think about think about the logistics. So if you've got the, this. Hemodilution taking place. Hemoglobin's leaving mom, going to the baby, right? What, what's what's Mother Nature trying to do? Trying to get iron out of the mom to allow for more milk, the production of milk. And again, it's it sounds almost heretical, but to do a blood donation to increase milk production, it's like that's genius. And so it, what's what's really interesting is there's a, a fundamental decision that needs to be made inside our, our body every day. And it's actually made in the, in the, the bone marrow of our long bones. And there, there are these cells there that are called nurse cells. They, that's really their name. They're called nurse cells. And they have to make a fundamental decision. Are we going to make bone? Or are we going to make blood? Bone, blood, bone, blood. <laughs> and you think, wait a minute, they're, they're already keeping track of two and a half million uh, red blood cells a second, but they've got to keep track of this bone thing. But it's like, oh, lactation or blood replacement. It's like, it's it's absolutely amazing when you think about it. And so I think the, the body is easily overwhelmed and you start giving it too much iron and it starts to dull the, the wisdom of the body. So what's important for the listeners to understand is that They've heard that people have heard the term, oh, your iron, or excuse me, your copper toxic. And that's based on a blood test. Well, it turns out that 1% that of the copper in our body is in our blood. 1%. Where's 47%? 47% of the copper in the human body is in the bone marrow, hanging out with the nerve cells. Another 27% is with the muscles. So 74% of our copper is bone and muscle trying to figure out what to do. And no one's talking about that. And so um, I think it's really important for, for the um, listeners out there to really step back and say, wow, I've, I've got some things I need to learn. And I need to take the time to, to listen to these types of conversations. You know, by all means, get the book Cure Your Fatigue. So you get a better fun foundational understanding of, of how does the body actually make energy and, and where is copper in that whole equation. And really begin to create a backdrop of understanding so that you can ask better questions. So you can have better dialogue with your birthing practitioner. And again, it's, it's not to be um, combative. It's, it's really meant to be, it's a discovery. I, I really want to understand uh, what, what the trade-offs are. And I, I want to I be relaxed about it. And I want you to be relaxed about it. But I think we need to have a. I think we need to have dialogue about this, because I think it's what's what's happening, and I've seen it many many times. Um, couples are all prepared for this beautiful home experience, only to find out that well, you know, hemoglobin's you know it's not not uh, twelve. You can't do it at home, and like what? And where these edicts come from? I I just think people need to begin to to challenge that, and then if they're if they're and again, this is easier said than done, but if you're really uh, committed to a home birth, well, then you follow through with a home birth, whether you have a practitioner there or not. 
And that's that's a bold thing to say. And again, it's not meant to be critical of the practitioners. It's just you have to decide what what side of nature are you going to come down on? And to what extent do you believe in your body's ability to mm. take care of itself? And I think that's where there's a lot of vulnerability now is people are so mm-hmm. doubtful about their natural ability to stay in homeostasis. It's like, well, it's actually pretty straightforward. Once you understand um, an ancestral diet, once you understand what minerals do, once you understand what fat does in the diet, it, it gets a lot easier. But again, we, we've got to work our way through those um, transitions. Mm-hmm. I was just going to sh- share like a uh, not personal story of what happened to me, but my friend who I'll keep anonymous was going through this situation uh, a few months ago where her um, iron on a, on a lab test in, in my opinion, as far as what we can see was kind of reflecting normal physiology and the midwife of course um, had her standards that she wanted to answer to, or maybe had to answer to. And so my friend actually got on the phone with, uh, with Morley himself and he was just incredibly encouraging to her and, just really, it really came down to him asking her, do you trust your body as maybe one of the top priority questions to ask yourself, which is so funny because that's not typically a question you're asking yourself when it's all heightened and your amygdala is firing and there's all these rules and things. And, um, and when you asked her that it was just really, it was really impactful. And what she ended up doing was they, I guess, ended up terminating the, the care with that with that midwife or vice versa. Mm. And she ended up having her, her Mm. home birth, home birth. And it was perfect and beautiful. And baby was so healthy. And yeah, she just went back and asked herself, like, have I been nourishing and taking care of myself during this pregnancy? And do I know that my body is Mm -hmm. going to do what it was created and innately designed to do? And she decided, she decided to take that leap towards trust. And that was so impactful for me to watch as, as a friend of Mm -hmm. mine. And I, I just so appreciate that you got on the phone with her and just kind of put the power back yeah. in her hands is what you did. You didn't even, you didn't even say, well, I'm, uh, this is what I would do. Like you literally, mm-hmm. you literally put the power back in her hands so she could make an informed decision on her own. Really right. cool. And I, and I really think it's what, what everyone needs to do is face that same decision. And again, there are, are there complications? Of course there are. We know that happens, but it's, I, I think it's, we're at a point where we need to take uh, a, a bolder stance to, um, step into our own greatness and, and be willing to to uh, take the actions to, to support that. I would love to hear just as a kind of functional answer, because I know a lot of women who sort of stumble into this realm and sort of start to realize that prenatals, you know, may not be the best approach and they want mm-hmm. to prioritize whole food nutrition or whole food nutrition. Right. What would you encourage them to prioritize? Because so this conversation is fresh to me. I have a, a really dear friend who's pregnant Mm-hmm. And um, she is kind of dabbling in this idea of, you know, switching from synthetic to whole food supplementation. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of sat down and was looking at, you know, the nutritional profile of prenatals versus just like, you know, mm-hmm. beef liver, even uh, desiccated. Right. Sure. And honestly, you're not missing a ton. I, and I, I really, once I started kind of breaking it down, it, it almost seems like you could replace a prenatal with, you know, beef liver, vitamin E, magnesium, Absolutely. Um, maybe cod liver oil and like a vitamin C supplement. Mm-hmm. And that would almost give you really everything you need. I'd, I'd love to hear if you have anything to add to that, because I think, you know, what a, my fear is that women will hear this, that, you know, a prenatal may not be the most supportive thing and they go, okay, well, I won't do that. But then they don't look for that other nourishment. Right. And so I really want to make sure that we're giving very, um, just attainable advice. And I get that, you know, each woman to an extent will have some bio individual needs, but as a whole, sure. what would you encourage women to prioritize if they do want to make the shift away from prenatals? No, I think it, I think it's important to to think like your ancestors. Mm. I mean, it's, and it's, it's a, it sounds glib, but it's important. You know, what, um, are you eating food that your great grandmother would recognize? That's a good place to start. Um, and we would never advocate eliminating something without replacing it with something mm-hmm. more natural. And that's really what, what when, we, when we talk about the RCP, um, the protocol itself, it's, it's really making sure that people are getting nutrient-dense support in their diet. And again, the, the, uh, imp- the importance of the minerals, the importance of the, the, the B vitamins, the importance of retinol. I mean, it's, it's hard to emphasize how important retinol is uh, particularly in, in light of the, the preoccupation with vitamin D. 
um, again, we take the stance that there's a difference between real vitamin C and ascorbic acid. That's a you know a day long debate that we can have, um, but but the point is that there are very specific food choices that people can make to get these uh, nutrients. And again, when when you're talking about uh, eating you know like oysters or uh, beef liver or other organ meats or um, you're, you're making bone broth and things of that nature, you're going to expose the body to a very uh, nutrient intense array of of Fiddles, as we call them, and that I think that's important. And it's that again, we don't think about how refined and dumbed down our our food system is. It's a it's, it's a very different world than what our ancestors grew up with. And again, it's we don't have the luxury of each one of us having a homestead and having you know five acres that we can grow our food on. It's just we don't we don't have that luxury. But what we've got to do is take advantage of the farmers who are very devoted to this and make sure we know what they're doing to feed their soil, to feed their crop, to feed their animals. And, you know, here's an example of um, eating, eating eggs that are produced by chickens that are e eating organic corn and soy. Well, that's not progress. Chickens are not supposed to be eating organic corn and soy. They're supposed to be eating grass and bugs. That's really what chickens are designed to do. So we have, we have to kind of go through this reprogramming about what is real food. And, and I, I well remember the, um, the, the debate with my oldest daughter around this very topic. And finally, in a, in a moment of desperation, she said, well, what, what's the label look like on real food? I said, okay, now we can solve this problem. There is no label on real food. And she went, I get it. I understand now. And it, it and again, it was a very sincere uh, desire on her part to really understand what this real food thing is. But now, now it's like, okay, so now she's got this beautiful urban garden, er, herbs, get it, urban garden. And she's in the middle of Boston and just thriving and doing great. So it's just, you know, uh, it's allowing people uh, the discovery of, of what is real food. And um, I'll, allowing their body to recognize what real food is and does it take more time yes and and does it uh does it get frustrating finding real food yes you know um there's some pundits out there who won't even eat out now i'm not going to name them by name but they're they're um luminaries in the, in the field of nutrition and medicine who they, they simply will not eat food in a restaurant anymore well that's a that's a bold stance to take you know, and Dr. Liz and I aren't quite at that point, but but we recognize that we're compromising our, our physiology because, again, we don't want to know the corners that have been cut in the restaurants, and your listeners don't either, but they have been cut. And and it's just we we live in challenging times. And and the the, the beauty of conversations like this is people get a, a waterfront of, of understanding about what's going on, and then they've got to decide what they're really committed to because 100% of your listeners are not going to do 100% of what we're saying. It's just it's not going to happen. And, and I, at, at some level, I don't blame them, but I think if, if the um, focus is about producing healthy babies, uh, then I would, I would put a lot of emphasis on making sure you're eating real food and you're being real careful about uh, the process of preparing that. So again, it's, it's, all, it's right. all, it's all a choice. It's all mm -hmm. a choice. I love that you call it a choice. That's something that uh, that conversation comes up a lot, actually, in just the online space. Is we see a lot of victim mindset, and I get it. I've been there. I've I can see my old self and go, oh, that was a victim. That was a victim state of believing that life is happening to me, and there's not really anything I can do about it. Right. But what can we do, you know, to take full advantage of? Yes, these are my life circumstances, and how can I make choices? Life is a right. series of choices where. I can right. support my body best and provide a create and curate a and nurture a healthier generation. And that brings right. me to the conversation of babies, you know, being born and then growing up life outside of the womb. One of our most common questions was why we are also seeing this kind of epidemic of, you know, anemic babies. And I I wonder if that is also just 
you know, mom not being able to have enough copper in her diet and then just being, is that just kind of history Mm -hmm. repeating itself basically? If, if we really wanted to geek out, (laughs) we could, we could take one of uh, Dr. McArdle's diagrams and just show people just in the placenta, the activity of the ceruloplasmin, hephaestin, and zyclopin. And it's like uh, three different subway systems that are needed to manage the movement of these metals. And what we don't really know, because I don't think the testing is there, is what's important for the the listeners to understand that um, when when we're working with copper enzymes, there's something called level and there's something called activity. So think of level as like someone's height. You know, I'm, I'm six feet tall. That's my level. But, but you can't tell by looking at me how intelligent I am, right? And the, and the thing is, in a lot of the testing that's done in, in the world of copper metabolism, all the optics are on height and not about IQ. And what we don't know is what is the IQ of suuloplasmin, the IQ of hephaestin, the IQ of zyclopen, and not just the mom, but the baby. It's a big deal. Call me crazy. I think it's maybe one of the most important series of, of enzyme functions to understand if we're really seeking to optimize the production of healthy babies, I'd like to know how iron and copper is being regulated by those three enzymes, just because they're of paramount importance. And if if we're now facing a crisis with with, uh, children being born who are deemed anemic, what that tells me is that they're copper deficient. They didn't get the download. They They didn't get the download from mom Maybe because she didn't have it. I don't I don't know. Or is it because there's so much iron in her system from the prenatals that she's been taking that that's affecting? And, and these are uncomfortable questions to be asking. But, but the thing is, um, as soon as we use the phrase, that person is anemic, that means in the blood, and we need to think back, what's going on in the tissue level? What's, what's the recycling program? How's the recycling program working in this fetus or this newborn baby? Do we even know? Do, we, do they ever even do a basic blood test to find out what the different levels of copper are? You know, copper, the suuloplasmin. Do we know what, what uh, hemoglobin is versus serum iron versus ferritin? Do we know what vitamin A versus vitamin E is in the, in the newborn? Boy, those are, those are basic parameters that would be really helpful to have a working knowledge of what's the context, what's the rationale for why there might be anemia in this child. And again, it's anemia in the blood. Let's pull back and say, could there in fact be an overload in the tissue? And that's what I would argue is that that's probably what the crisis is, is that the child is in fact overloaded with iron. And my my working hypothesis around autism is that the the child is full, their liver is full of iron. There's not enough copper there, not not adequate levels of copper. The child gets uh, exposed to a shot, which has a lot of chemicals in it. A liver full of iron can't clear the, the chemicals. And then you've got oxidative stress. And, and it's not rocket science to Google uh, autism, oxidative stress. And that's not a criticism. It's just a statement of fact that that these children are being um, produced and they have a, a disproportionate representation of metals uh, in their body, but especially in their liver. And I think there needs to be more focus on that and more awareness about uh, these other enzymes that are meant to manage and regulate uh, the flow of metals and gases in the body. You've probably already thought of this, but it just dawned on me that in, you know, back in my research of jabs or shots, um, learning the statistic that 
the highest um, population of autism is in African American boys. And so mm. it makes me wonder if, and especially firstborns. And so it makes me wonder with, you know, African African American skin, darker skin, needing more copper, if they would, mm. if that would make them even more vulnerable to being iron overloaded as babies, and then then they get the jab, right. and then that that makes a lot of sense. Is that something you've yeah. you've thought about? I haven't thought about it, but but it certainly intuitively it makes sense. And I think that that's the kind of, of um, higher order thinking that we need to be doing. You saying mm-hmm. it, it isn't necessarily a disease. It's that maybe we don't have a, f- a, a proper working knowledge of what the mineral requirements are mm. and the nutrient requirements and, and think about it from that standpoint as well. Yeah. And it, uh, speaking of the skin thing, I, I've heard you talk about melanin and what, what is it? What is it that the needs mm-hmm. for copper goes up? What did you tell me? Well, um, one of my Amish friends encouraged me to read these books by uh, Pat Colby. She's a famous Australian uh, animal farmer, uh, C-O-L-E-B-Y. She wrote four books, um, Natural Goat Care, Natural Sheep Care, Natural Cattle Care, Natural Horse Care. Uh, and they're four of, the, four of the most important books I've ever cool. read because <clears throat> they, really they really helped me understand what was going on. But um, in each of the books, she talks about the fact that any animal that is copper deficient has parasites. Any animal that has parasites is copper deficient. But then she, she goes on further in the book to talk about research that was done in Japan during the 1960s. I've not found the, the original research. One of these days I will. I'm a pretty persistent guy. In this research, they were studying copper requirements for animals with black hair. Black cat, black dog, black sheep, right? Black Angus, you know, black horse, right? Gorillas. And and any any human that has black hair. Asians, Malaysians, Africans, you know, again, and <clears throat> the melanin requirement to support the black hair is enormous. <clears throat> what they discovered is that the any animal with black hair needs six times more copper in their diet than mm. an animal that doesn't have black hair. That's an enormous difference. Six times more copper, which comes back, Corey, to your comment about the, uh, the African-American children. Again, is there legitimacy to that? I don't know, but it's, it's raising some pretty powerful and provocative questions. And... The thing is that the um, the, the copper is MIA. It's it's not in the it's not in the farming system the way it used to be, and so it's we're we're really bumping up against some some stark reality here. And again, our ancestors grew up knowing that nuts and seeds and sea fish and uh, you know organ meats and things like that. Yeah, they've got copper. We don't need to worry about. It. Well, we do need to worry about it now because the, the food system has changed. It isn't, mm-hmm. it isn't what it, it was. The food system today is not what our, our great-great-grandparents uh, knew it to be. So I, I think the, the whole dynamic of melanin is profoundly important. And again, it's, it's playing in the background. Who knew? And we, we don't think about that when we're ordering our latte. You know, what color is my hair? But, <laughs> but it's important to, to realize that we have biological requirements. And so that if you're working with people who do have black hair, regardless of their ethnicity, then you know they have a a biological need for copper that supersedes anything you've ever seen before. And it's, you know, it's just, it's so central to our physiology, but we haven't been trained to think that way. And so that's, that's what these types of conversations do is help to really spark that awareness. Morley, this has been a fantastic conversation, and I have confidence we could talk for another several hours, but we do want to honor your time, um, (laughs) and we just so appreciate you just sharing your wisdom with us. Uh, For those listening, you may have heard us reference RCP or Root Cause Protocol. Um, Please go look that up. Morley created this protocol, and um, I'm actually currently dabbling in it a bit after getting my full Monty back, and I mean, goodness, I can't say enough good things. Um, And in truth, a lot of you listeners are probably doing about half of the protocol without even knowing it because the principles are very much um, 
relevant to, you know, what Corey and I um, teach and talk about, you know, in her course and uh, my resources. But Morley, we just want to thank you so much for coming on. We will absolutely link um, all of your, you know, books, um, uh, the protocol. I mean, goodness, there's so many things that we need to share with our audience that you have just created and brought to the space. So we just want to thank you so much for sharing your time, your wisdom with us. Um, and we're just so honored to have had you on today. So we appreciate that. Well, absolutely. And really, uh, time flies, right? Okay. And uh, uh, certainly, uh, if, if there's value in continuing the dialogue, happy to do that. What I find is that there are many situations where uh, it's, maybe it's important to have a chance to have a Q&A. Because mm. I, know, I know this type of discussion will generate questions. I guarantee that. And uh, if that would be of benefit to your community, happy to do that. Because uh, I think we've we've covered a lot of ground, mm -hmm. but in some respects, it feels like we're just getting started. Absolutely, mm -hmm. so. yes, we will pocket that idea. Actually, if you know, after this episode launches, potentially coming back with sort of a part two to break yeah. down in more detail a lot of the concepts that we just kind of scratched the surface of today. So, thank you so much for suggesting Absolutely. that. Because again, we do appreciate your time, um, and we would love to have you on. I, I mean, as as frequently as we can make work, because this is just a great conversation. <laughs> well, yeah, I think I think your listeners might get a little tired, but uh, no, but, no. I, I, uh, I I've never met a question I didn't enjoy, and I want to make sure people feel that that they are at liberty to ask the tough questions, because mm -hmm. because if they can ask in in this dialogue some tough questions, they're going to feel more confident to do it when they're working with their practitioners. Mm -hmm. So I, that's really the one of the values of that kind of exchange. Totally. So, it's been a, it's been an absolute delight. And uh, you guys are very easy to chat with. I appreciate Thank that you. very much. And um, hopefully this will have been of benefit to your community. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on. And we will see you guys in the next episode. Mm -hmm.